2,000 years ago, we used to have whole dictionaries of sex in Arabic. And one of them, one of these medieval dictionaries, um, imaginatively uh, entitled, um, and forgive me on the video, uh, The Language of Fucking. First, I wanted to ask, uh, because we tend to think of the, of the Arab world in, in very political terms, why sex? Why is that so important? So, why did I choose sex as, yeah, as, 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 the, as my lens? As the focus of your book, yeah. So, I appreciate you know, spending five years traveling across the Arab world, talking to people about sex can either strike you as a dream job or a highly dubious occupation. <laughs> but the reason for it is twofold. I mean, it's why sex and why, why the Arab world. So right. I became interested mm -hmm. in the Arab world because of my connection to the Arab world. I'm, I'm half Egyptian. My family live in Egypt, most of them. Uh, I carry an Egyptian passport, and I'm Muslim. But as was mentioned, I grew up in Canada, and mm -hmm. I never really thought much about my Arab heritage <coughs> until September 11th. And the events of that day and the aftermath really prompted me to think, what is going on in this part of the world? I heard so many people talk about those Muslims and those Arabs that I said, look, you know what? I have a possibility to discover this on my own. I have a privileged access. And so I wanted to reorient my career to the Arab region. The reason I chose sex was because of my connection to HIV AIDS. And if you want to understand HIV in the Arab world, you have to look at sex because it is the major route of transmission for most cases in the region. Most people think we don't have a lot of HIV in the Arab world, and that's actually true for the moment. We have these isolated, uh, concentrated epidemics. But I can tell you there are only two parts of the world in which the number of new infections from HIV and the number of deaths from HIV are increasing, and one of those two regions is the Arab region. And so I want to understand what is going on around sex and the taboos around sex and how is that affecting our response to HIV. But then I realized that beyond the actual sort of sexual act and risky practices and that very sort of narrow biological medical definition of sex, that if one looked at sexuality more broadly, so these are the attitudes and behaviors and beliefs and values, they actually give you a lens onto society because it interacts with politics and with economics and with religion and with tradition and gender and, and generations. And at the end of the day, if you really want to know a people, start by looking inside their bedrooms. And that's exactly what I did. And um, the, one, of the, one of the things that attracted me to your book, um, it may seem a little odd uh, bringing in another country, but Ireland is a country that has been in the news a lot lately, at least in my Twitter feed, because I've been following the fallout from the Magdalene laundries. Does everybody here know about that? These were, this was a gulag of prisons for profit laundries run by the Catholic Church. And uh, the focus has been on the involvement of the church and the, the state. Uh, starting in 1922 when Ireland became independent. And what has really struck me for the past couple of months is just how the church came to power after independence and really abused people on a, a, a widespread basis uh, and, you know, got, got government power as well. And, of course, I feel like we're seeing echoes of this in Egypt with the Muslim Brotherhood that... Um, Theocrats can use the sort of rhetoric of independence and rebellion to take power. And I was just wondering if you have some thoughts about that and how that's affecting people. It's, it's interesting. The, the conservative attitudes towards sexuality you find beyond the Islamic conservatives. And if I can just give you one example. So I was down in Tahrir Square, you know, at the center of the uprisings. This is in 2011. And I was talking to young protesters about their fight for political freedom. And I asked them, uh, do you think this political freedom could ever lead to sexual freedom? 
And one of the young women I spoke to, uh, quite a, a highly educated uh, student, t uh, literature student, but from a rural area, she said, yes, absolutely. You know, there are some people here, they have a free sexual life. I believe in this. Paris 68, it is forbidden to forbid. I wish we could have that here. So she took me across the square to where people were camped out. And these were the real die-hard protesters. And they were, you know, fighting and, and literally dying in the streets uh, around us uh, fighting the security forces. And I met one of her fellow students. And I asked him, a liberal guy, asked him, do you think that this political freedom will lead to sexual freedom? And he said to me, no, 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 no. This is not the freedom we are fighting for. The political freedom is one thing. We are Arabs, we are Muslims, we believe in the marriage institution, and that's the citadel of which I speak in my book, that the only socially accepted context for sexual life is family approved, religiously approved, state registered matrimony. He said, that's all we want, we don't want anything else. And this is a guy who is you know, on the cutting edge of the liberal movement. And so you don't have to be an Islamic conservative to, have, to, to uh, adhere to these conservative values. And, and that's why I think the rise to political prominence of the Islamists mm -hmm. in Egypt mm -hmm. is actually in a funny way not a, bad, not a bad thing for those of us who are interested in sexual rights. Because these conservative currents mm -hmm. during the long years of dictatorship, this rise of Islamic fundamentalism was happening under the table. You couldn't challenge it, we didn't really talk about it. Now it is on the table, and we are discussing it very openly, and we are starting to talk about who speaks for Islam, what is the role of Islam in public life. And that's absolutely key, because one of the points I make in the book is that today we have these very narrow interpretations on Islam on a whole variety of issues, not just sex. But there have been times in history when we have had much more open thinking. About, uh, about all matters, including the role of women, including sexual issues. And we have gravitated to this very narrow place. And this is largely to do with the rise of Islamic conservatism. But now it is on the table, we are talking about it, and people are challenging it now. And this is a very important step forward, I think, for achieving uh, sexual rights uh, in, in the years to come. Who does speak for Islam? We all speak for Islam. Each of us as Muslims should be speaking for Islam. This is the beauty, in my opinion, as a practicing Muslim. This is the beauty of Islam. It oh. is ijtihad, which is, the, uh, is independent reasoning in Islam, is an individual duty. They may tell us otherwise. The, the people who want to use religion to control us will tell us differently. But now we have a moment to stand up and say no. It is our right to think for ourselves and to speak for ourselves. And if we do that in politics, we can do that in religion. And hopefully we will one day start to do that in sexual life as well. That gentleman you referred to. Atopic sorry, Square, sorry, I, I can't Atopic, hear you. The gentleman you referred to, the top of square. Yes. Said that we're not looking to change our mm -hmm, sexual mm -hmm, mm -hmm. said he's at the cutting edge politically. Yeah. I don't know that you would agree with what you just said. Absolutely not, and that's the nature of a democracy now. That's the nature of the democracy. Ten years, when I started this book in 2007, we didn't have that space to disagree, and now we do. That's, that's the step forward for us. And I think, every, I think every religion has this problem. Every religious culture has this problem of people disagreeing, or, and some people deciding that they will impose their interpretation on everybody. Uh, and, but... One, another aspect of this I'm curious about is you actually mentioned this in some of your interviews and I think in the book. What's the role of economic freedom here? I mean, what, I wanted, what I'm trying to say is there's a difference. I think there's a difference between affluence and economic independence because you, you can be very rich or come from a rich family and be extremely beholden to them and so have no sexual freedom. In fact, sometimes very wealthy people are compelled to procreate. They can't choose to have a life without children. And I was just wondering, um, also, the, the stories we sometimes hear in the news about the Arab world focus on very rich people, very powerful people, and their sexual crimes or peccadilloes. But 
my sense of this is that you're more interested in the sexuality of the the middle classes or the emerging is that correct the, the people who want to be middle class I mean I, I the book largely focuses on middle class voices, but there are certainly people from all social, uh, mm -hmm. all elements mm -hmm. of the social spectrum. Okay. One of the reasons there's mainly middle class voices is that I wanted in the book not just focus on problems. We know there are lots of sexual problems in the Arab world. They're in the news all the time. One of the things I tried to do in relation to the problems is to assemble the evidence. What do we know empirically, in real, you know, serious research terms about sexual life in the Arab world? But what I tend to focus on in the book are solutions. Mm -hmm. People who are trying to find their way out of this, uh, these constraints. And those innovators tend to come from the educated classes, the, the middle classes. Mm -hmm. But certainly when I was, for example, meeting with sex workers across the region, I mean, these are often <coughs> desperately poor women. This is not a lifestyle choice for them. They have no other economic mm -hmm. choice. And, and this gets to, to, to your point. Mm -hmm. I mean, economics is a real driver of sexual behavior anywhere in the world. And it can take very explicit forms. So, for example, there is a type of prostitution in uh, Egypt. It's known as summer marriage in which uh, wealthy visitors from the Gulf states will come. Uh, they do a lot of shopping in, in Egypt, great for the economy. Mm -hmm. One of the things these male tourists often buy is a girl. And there are particular villages near Cairo in which girls are supplied for summer marriage. And uh, in, in Islam, sex outside of marriage is zinna. It's, uh, it's adultery and it is haram, it's forbidden. So they give this form of sex work an Islamic cover. They write mm -hmm. a contract which sort of checks all the boxes in terms of uh, marriage, dubious intent aside. And they enter into these uh, affairs. Uh, the girls spend maybe two weeks, a couple of weeks with the men. Uh, the men go home and the girls go back to their families. And it is a source of tremendous uh, angst for many, of, for, many of these, for many of these women. And that's driven by economics. And their parents, the parents are essentially prostituting their girls for the, for, for the money. So you talked about, I was actually very interested in this, because you talked about how it, the, sort of the structure of it, and that the money is paid to the family. Mm. Um, and also one impression I got from this was that the girls or the women who do summer marriages, temporary marriages, are they don't call themselves prostitutes. They no. they have they're operating in a kind of gray area. No one calls even frank sex workers would never self identify as sex workers. In, but, in, the, in my experience in the Arab region. Right. But it's but if you work at a brothel Still don't self-identify. Right, okay. What it, word it, would you use? You wouldn't refer to it. You, I, uh -huh. In my experience, I mean, I mean, the other issue is of terminology, so just as an aside, so uh -huh. in Arabic, we have now sort of come down to quite a restricted vocabulary around sex, which is one of the problems, because most of the language people use is from the street. And this is really inhibiting for women because the language is uh, considered to be vulgar, and women have a lot of trouble talking about sexuality mm -hmm. because the burden of the stigma and the taboo falls on them. Mm -hmm. And so added to that, they don't even have a language to speak about sex in a respectful manner. So I just, I'll just finish this point. What's interesting is that a thousand years ago, we used to have whole dictionaries of sex in Arabic. And one of them, one of these medieval dictionaries, um, imaginatively uh, entitled, um, and forgive me on the video, uh, The Language of Fucking, uh, uh, included over a thousand verbs for to have sex. And now we're so restricted, people don't even want to talk about it. And many people in the Arab region actually speak, feel more comfortable speaking about sex in English mm -hmm. or in French mm -hmm. or in Hebrew, if they're Palestinians in, in, in Israel, than they do in, uh, in Arabic. And so often these women just will not, they'll call themselves workers, for example, yeah. but they won't actively identify as sex workers. Well, actually, we have that here. A lot of uh, sex workers, I mean, sex worker is a kind of political term. Very few people use it outside of activism. So there are a lot of girls here who will say, I'm an escort or I'm a working girl, and they won't use very clinical language um, for similar reasons, just cultural. If I can give you an, an equivalent. So in, in Egypt, for example, the word for... Um, 
for prostitute is uh, sharmuta, and it's like it, essentially whore. Okay. And and this is the only word that people you know on the street will, mm -hmm. will recognize. With my UN hat on, I often use UN speak. So in particular for uh, men who have sex with men, there's a very long term for this in Arabic. But if you want to talk about homosexual, you call you call them mithli. And when I was speaking to some very educated doctors and talking about mithliin, mithliin, and they said, "What are you talking about?" And then they said, "Ah, you mean shawaz?" And shawaz in Arabic means deviant. And mm -hmm. this is the term mm -hmm. which is routinely used even in the media. So we have a real problem uh, around around language. Um, so, gentlemen, you had a you had a question. In Muslim culture, when someone is a sex worker, is that how they're perceived? Are you also asking whether this is seen as a job or an identity? Like whether a job versus an identity? You define my question. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking that's kind of where you're going. Is that what he's asking? I, I think in the context of, of, of sex work, um, it's such a shameful activity for women. So everybody for, knows for women. it's shameful. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of self-stigma. It's one of the great obstacles that is faced in even trying to even vaguely organize, um, uh, I'm going to use the politically correct term here, I'm going to sex worker, the, the, mm -hmm. the, I'm going to use UN speak here. Um, it's very hard to organize them. And one of the ironies around sex work is that it is both the most visible face of sex in the, in the Arab world. How many people here have been to Dubai? Okay. How many people have noticed the sex workers in the lobby of your hotel? Yes. So, yeah. How many won't admit? <laughs> so we're not so far from the Arab world after all. Um, so uh, so it, it's, it's a very visible face, but it's also an invisible face because m most of the women do not want to come forward. When we, when we do work on HIV, it's mm -hmm. incredibly hard to engage sex workers. Uh, female sex workers, male sex workers, and men who have sex with men, who are actually seen as even being more stigmatized because of the <coughs> homophobia, actually are much more outgoing, and largely because they are men. And therefore, no matter what their sexuality is, it's easier than being a woman. Because also, is it not the case that sometimes men engage in temporary marriage? You, you talked about that. Yeah, there are uh, as, 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 as if they were, I mean, escorts or yes, yes, there is gigolos or whatever. I mean, for, for money, basically. Absolutely. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's a double standard, really. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, there are these also uh, female uh, sex tourists who come to mm -hmm. uh, the, some of the resorts, and they often have relationships with, with the men. And it's not as frowned upon as if a woman... Like these summer, these summer marriages mm -hmm, that go on. Mm -hmm. there are, there's a real double standard. But get to, just to get where to did, your... wait, where do the female sex tourists come from? Oh, uh, <laughs> are these Arab women or are they Western women? They're they're Western. They're they're, Western. they're they're Western women. Um, one of the brokers who was involved in the summer marriage uh, business, finding girls for uh, the uh, Arab men, Gulf men visiting, he said. Hmm, yes, we do occasionally get women from the Gulf coming, but they actually want wow. to get a passport, so, it's, uh, so it has to be an official marriage. He said, wow, it's a lot of work. I'm not sure it's worth the money. <laughs> um, but, but to pick up your point on identity, it's quite, it's quite interesting because you see that duality in, amongst men who have sex with men. Mm -hmm. It's a whole spectrum of, of sexuality there because some men in the region most certainly do self-identify as gay. Uh, and yet a lot of men who have sex with, uh, with other men would, would completely reject those labels. They just don't feel that they apply to them. So their sexual identity is, is a very, it's much more fluid in the Arab region. And as one um, uh, very uh, cogent and really articulate uh, uh, queer activist in Lebanon told me, you know, really, you know, what are you talking about, Shireen, about sexual identities in the Arab region? We don't even have individual identities. She said, I am on the record of the government as the daughter of my father. And if I were to marry, I would become the wife of my husband. I don't exist as an individual. How do you expect me to have a sexual identity? And it really comes to the core of the difficulty of achieving you know, the, the essence of, a sex of, of sexual rights, which is a, a happy, satisfying, pleasurable sexual life free of coercion and discrimination and violence. If you don't have those individual rights and individual freedoms recognized and respected by the state, 
it's very difficult to achieve them in the context of a patriarchal family. So we have miles to go before any of this is conceivable in most of the Arab world. And, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask about was, so the, the temporary marriage of a girl whose parents, particularly her father, um, but the, the family's involved in the deal, the family benefits from the deal, the, the money, in one case you described a situation where the father received the money, he gave some to the daughter, she was doing all of the, the, the sexual labor, but, you know, she's part of this unit, so some of this money is being used for another family member's education. And, um, and then I was thinking, is temporary marriage harmful and so forth because of the sex work, or is it more about how the money is distributed? In other words, are there people in the brothels, for example, who just keep all of the money and perhaps dole out a little bit to their family? where it's a little bit reversed, which is what we do in the West. A lot of sex workers come here um, to the States, for example, from other countries, to work, and they'll send money back home, but the family doesn't know how much money they're making. They become dependent on, on the sex worker member, and she or he you know, has a little power, too. And I'm just wondering, does that scenario exist yet or in, you know, in Egypt, in other parts of the Arab world? So let me tell you a story which is not from sex work but actually illustrates that dynamic mm -hmm. very clearly. Mm -hmm. So one of the young women I met in Egypt, uh, her name is Amani, and she comes from the conservative south of the country. Mm -hmm. Amani is a tour guide and she makes quite a lot of money. Uh, and as a consequence of that, she's actually the main breadwinner for her family, her entire family, her, her father and her uh, brothers and sisters are dependent upon her. One day, a young man whom she had met through a friend came to the parents, brought his parents, wanted to marry Amani, and her parents said no. Now she's in her late 20s, and although she has all the financial power in the family in terms of the earning capacity, she has none of the control over her own life. Years passed. They kept arguing with the parents. She wanted to marry him. They said no. And one of the reasons they said no is that they didn't want to lose her income to right. go to the new couple. So she and her, um, and, and her, and her uh, clandestine fiancé decided to take matters into their own hands. So they traveled to Cairo and they had what's known as an Orphi marriage. This is a, um, a customary marriage. Depending on whom you ask, it is Islamically permissible or not. The criteria are actually quite flexible in Islam as to what constitutes a marriage. But there are some scholars who will say that these marriages are permissible, and that's why she had it. Because to her, as a practicing Muslim, it was inconceivable that she would have sex outside of marriage. She needed a marriage framework. And yet, when I asked her, but Amani, you are the breadwinner, you have the, the financial power, why do you not just get married in defiance of your parents? And she said, I cannot do that. It is not my reputation, it is my family's reputation, and it is my father's reputation. He mm -hmm. is the great man at the mosque. If I were to go against him, they would say he had an impolite, a disobedient daughter. I cannot go against my family. And, and so that's a very clear illustration that having the money doesn't give you the power, especially if you're a woman. But, right, but are there, in the brothels, for example, are you more likely to meet somebody who is more in control of her finances? Uh, not in my experience, no. No, okay. I was just wondering. Because the patriarchy works no matter where you are. I mean, most, uh, mm -hmm. most uh, uh, sex workers are either under the control of, um, uh, of a, a pimp uh, or they're under the control of the, the, the madam. Uh, who is running running the show? Mm -hmm. So they have very little, uh, very little auto very little autonomy. But you're now you now you're talking about Egypt, or because it's a big yeah, region. I'm talking, mainly, I'm talking mainly about Egypt and looking at uh, uh, Morocco and and my experience mm -hmm. in, tun in in Tunisia. Tunisia. Um, yeah, I mean I should point out that there are is actually legal. Sex work is illegal yeah. in most of the Arab world, mm -hmm. except there are these pockets which are legacies of the uh, uh, colonial period in which sex work is legal, a certain form of it. And that's most pronounced in Tunisia, where they do have uh, still a network of legal brothels. It's, it's organized by the state. They have these regular medical exams. They earn a certain fixed, uh, fixed rate. Uh, but those, um, those brothels are now under attack by Islamists. 
and it's not clear how long that system will last. Have, have they succeeded in actually shutting down a district, uh, a brothel them. district in, in Tunisia? I mean, I, I read about this when it started happening. I was horrified. Yeah, almost. Uh, there used to be, there were close to 300 uh, legal sex workers mm -hmm. in Tunisia before mm -hmm. the uprising. It's probably down to less than a hundred. Mm. Now uh, they used to have uh, little brothel zones in each of the major towns in Tunisia. Now it's reduced to two. Uh, Tunis and a place called Sfax, so the two major centers. And yes, that's due to pressure from Islamists. Mm. Uh, I have a question about uh, mm -hmm. the terminology that uh, in Egypt used was yeah. So many I'm not saying what it's Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You could ask as you are just to just carry on and yeah. just okay. ask a question. My name is Mary. Yeah. Um my question is about um the self identification is an important step in, in generating political consciousness. So I was wondering if you could comment about how gay and lesbians in gay men and lesbians in, and queer people generally in Egypt self identify and what state of um, political activism there and and how it's been affected by the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood since the revolution. Wow, okay, tall order here. All right, in terms of terminology, I'm going to talk about men who have sex with men and women who have sex with women, engage in same-sex relations. Because as I said, some people very clearly self-identify as gay, lesbian, uh, or queer. But that, in my experience, you know, or in Arabic, I mean, uh, but, but, uh, but that's a minority. In my experience, many people do not. Uh, and the political consciousness you're talking about, I mean, there, is, there, there are little groups across the Arab world, and this is one of the sort of sets of solutions I'm talking about, not just problems. We have, you know, crushing homophobia in, in most of the Arab region. And if you were to come out to your parents in, in, in Egypt, the most likely step would be an immediate trip to the doctor to see if they can somehow fix you. And so reparative therapy is, is big across the, the Arab region. You know, religious conversion, uh, Muslim, Christian, Christian, Muslim, highly controversial, matter of life and death. Sexual conversion, absolutely no problem. They're how does all, it, they're all how is it done? I mean, what's the technique, so to speak? Uh, it depends. Uh, there is, uh, sometimes there will, will be religious healing, that somehow the power of, um, of, of prayer and Quranic recitation will uh, sometimes switch, somehow switch you over. Uh, very often, um, go to a general practitioner and you'll get prescribed uh, 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 various uh, antidepressants or anxiolytics and get, you know, fire and brimstone lecture. Um, there are some psychiatrists who practice a more sort of, how do I put this, a more, um, a slightly more rigorous form of reparative therapy. It does have some basis, however flawed, um, but there is some method to it. Uh, but it's very, it's, 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 it's the routine. If you come out to your parents, that's what's going to happen mm -hmm. to you. Uh, in terms of the sort of organizing, there are these extraordinary groups of young activists. Uh, they tend to be uh, under age 40. They tend to be more educated. They speak very good English. They are connected to the wider world of uh, LGBTQ activism. There is even some, they actually have a camp now. It's called uh, Montekitna Camp where the activists who work on these issues from across the region come together once a year in a secret location to share experiences and to talk about how do we move forward. What's really interesting about all these groups, and, and they're a minority of a minority, all right? but when you talk to them, they know chapter and verse the history of the gay rights movement in the West. And they can tell you with extreme precision why they think it will not work in the Arab world. They want something completely different. They do not accept you know, identity politics, sexual identity politics. They say, what is the point of us fighting for the rights of a tiny minority, irrespective of the crushing homophobia, if we do not achieve justice and freedom and equality and dignity for, for, for everyone, not just minorities, for everyone in you know, coming out of these oppressive systems. So it's a very different conceptualization of how you would go about getting getting achieving rights and achieving space in my experience most um, people who have sex with their own sex or are transgendered or transsexual are not looking for the freedom to come out they want the freedom to stay in and live their lives behind closed doors and do as they choose they are looking for privacy and one of the interesting experiences i've had is 
working with religious leaders and men who have sex with men. Now, you can only do this if you're talking about HIV. So I was part of a project that over the course of many years brought these two, you know, chalk and cheese groups together. And we did this under the aegis of HIV. If we wanted to talk about gay rights, absolutely no way would we get religious leaders to come to the table. But this was a rich mix of Shia, Sunni, uh, Imams, and also Christian uh, uh, clergy from across the denominations. And what was fascinating is that over these years, these groups came together. At the beginning, there was huge suspicion, and particularly the religious leaders, had all these extraordinary ideas about these men, that they were rapists and pedophiles, and that they were you know, indulgent and debauched, and they had no idea of the reality of these men's lives. It sounds like the United States. <laughs> Well, you know what, I was standing in one of these meetings and they were talking about sort of conservative values and yeah. I thought, where is George Bush? I know, it may not sound like Canada, but it sounds like the U.S. to, to me anyway. Yeah, it, it, you know, these, the, these issues are not unique to the Arab world or the Islamic right. world. We see them across the, the global south and indeed uh, in, in America as well. Mm -hmm. But what was most interesting about this sort of process of accommodation is that one of the religious leaders I talk about in the book, he said, look, you know what, these 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 men are our brothers. I want to find a way to reach out to them. I cannot tell them that their behavior is halal, that it is per permitted. Although, as, an as a side point, there are some Islamic scholars now, uh, elsewhere in the Muslim world, who are actually questioning what is the taboo around homosexuality. You know, what are the, what are the, 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 the canonical uh, texts really telling us about homosexuality in, in Islam? But that sort of thinking isn't catching on in the Arab world as yet. But the point of, of commonality was privacy. In Islam, we have a real emphasis on your business is your business, and it is a sin to spy on someone else. And if you want to, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. want to accuse someone of a crime, you need to have four eyewitnesses mm -hmm. or an uncoerced confession. So in this discussion about privacy, for example, you can think that there might be a way of accommodating men who have sex with men within the context of, of, of Islam. And that's exactly what, in my experience, many of the men I've spoken to, that's what they're looking for. But this goes back to the point that there are alternative interpretations within Islam. It's not a monolith. And when the conservatives give their point of view, they present it like there is no alternative. But that's simply not the case. What about the rise of... <coughs> we, we have a question. We'll come back. Yes. Uh, um, thank, thank you both for um, your work and your witness. It's really, really important. Um, I have two questions. Um, what is the covert power that women exercise in, um, in, in Egypt and Arab societies? And uh, in, in, presumably in traditional marriages and, and daughters and, and wives and uh, mothers. And, and uh, what about the non-Arab world? I think particularly of Turkey, where women uh, are, are demonstrating to be able to put on a hijab. In Iran, where they wish that they didn't have to, and in Indonesia, where we're not sure, and uh, uh, fertility rates are two, two children per minute. And Iran, which is now a model, model country for the American population. So there are really interesting changes that are also not in the Arab world. I just wonder if you have any perspectives on that. Yeah, I mean, I'll take the second question first. I, absolutely, there are similar debates going on in many parts of the Islamic world. I didn't actually look at them in the context of my book, and I can't speak with any great uh, authority. I, I, I've read the books that, have, that are commenting on this. Uh, but you're right. I mean, there are, in many respects, in other Muslim countries, they are further ahead in tackling some of the issues that we are grappling with in the Arab world. And quite frankly, most of the innovation around Islam is not coming from the heart of Islam. It's coming from outside. That's not really a surprise. The challenge we have now is in translating that into the region. And you already see that with a number of NGOs that are trying to, for example, deal with sexuality education, <coughs> trying to get it into schools. The, the levels of sexual knowledge and information in the Arab world are really uh, horrifying. I mean, the, the story I always uh, give about this is that uh, I was asked by a young acquaintance who is a, a student uh, at a business school at one of Egypt's leading universities. And she came to me and she asked me, uh, Dr. Shanine, I have a question. I want to know if uh, I can uh, become pregnant if my fiance stands in front of the air conditioner. 
<laughs> and it turns out that the only class that she had had on a reproduction was plant biology. And she had confounded uh, pollen huh. with sperm. And so mm -hmm. this is one of the more educated people you can imagine what's happening for the rest. Mm -hmm. So there are very interesting um, uh, models elsewhere on these sort of sensitive issues. And thanks to the internet, in large part, it's now sort of percolating into the region. Um, in terms of the power of women, absolutely. And, and, we, and we tend to underestimate that even in the patriarchy, women do have uh, tremendous uh, influence. And you see it in how they raise their boys. Mm -hmm. uh, and the key to getting change and dealing with all the, the taboo, particularly around women's sexuality and women's independence, is how you educate boys and girls, not just in the classroom, but in the living room. And it's the key, it's the key to changing things. So, for example, I, I talk about a woman in my book. Uh, she runs a club, a uh, Facebook site and radio for divorced women because divorce is still a huge taboo. It's the rates are increasing dramatically in most of the Arab world, but a divorced woman is seen as a, as, a, as a broken woman, as a loose woman. She often has to move home when she's divorced, and that's not just for financial reasons. It's not acceptable for her to live as an independent woman. And I asked her, uh, this woman, uh, what do you think about um, the ability of Western people to have relations before marriage, that freedom? And she paused and she said, you know, I don't think that that's such a great thing. And I, I said, well, do you not think it leads to stronger marriages because you have a chance to get to know each other? And she said, no, I, I don't think so. Just look at Madonna and her many divorces. But what she did Liz say... Liz Taylor. Me, well, exactly. And what she did say to me, though, is that what I really admire in the West is how boys are brought up and mm -hmm. how men and women interact within marriage. Now, of course, people in the Arab world know the West through the Internet and movies and television series, not a 2020 vision, not 2020 vision on the Western sexual life. <laughs> Nonetheless, what they are longing for is to have that equality and companionship and romance and really parity within marriage. In my experience, many women do. And uh, that's, what they, that's what they are longing for. What are they reading this very time? What do they read in their... The Harlequin novels? Ah, well, I have a whole mm. section on that. Mm. So, so the Harlequin novels, so many, many women uh, complained to me about how useless their husbands were in bed. <laughs> and as one of them said to me, you know, five minutes, it is over, no kissing, no cuddling, nothing. He, he turns out, he rolls over, falls to sleep, then he puts on the television. And so I thought this is so contrary to the archetype of the, of the Arab lover, the, uh, the sheikh, you know, the Rudolf Valentin. So I gave some of these books to my friends in Egypt to read, and they were absolutely, I mean, they were just flabbergasted. Which, where, where which books? Which books? Sorry. Oh, in English. In English. The, these books are not really available. There's in, a whole genre in, in, in Parsi. Yeah, there, you know, there used to be in the 1960s and 70s these books, and so I went into a bookstore with a friend, and she's a Mohagaba, she's covered, and we, we tried to find these books, and, and they took her aside and said, you know, madam, you really should not be asking for such things. <laughs> uh, so, so, is this a bookstore in Bistra? Sorry, what was it? This is a bookstore in Kahira, in Cairo. By yeah. the way, you have the microphone. Oh, oh. <laughs> Sorry, you're talking into your beer bottle, I'm wondering. <laughs> were, were you referring to a bookstore in, uh, in Cairo? Yeah, it was. Uh, it was uh, I, actually, it was Shuruk. If you know Cairo, it's in, in, it's in downtown. Um, yeah, so they were just flabbergasted at these, at, these, at these views. But again, it goes back to the history, because if you go back to the long history of Arabic erotica, they are going on and on and on about how to please women sexually. This mm -hmm. is so important. Mm -hmm. and, and it stems from the history of Islam, that Islam is not anti-sex, although it's perceived as such, absolutely, and that's due to the narrowing of interpretations. But in its essence, Islam recognizes the power of sex, it tries to channel it, but the Prophet himself spoke you know, movingly about the importance of sexual pleasure for men and for women. As a consequence of that, we have centuries of these books which go into great detail about technique. And all that is lost today. And, and so the question is, as we move forward into what we are hoping, a new era, how are we going to reopen that and rediscover that spirit? So these books are, I mean, they, they have a bit of a cult following in the West. Are these uh, the sheikh, uh, the desert romance? And are you speaking of? Well, or books about sexual technique? or what, uh, What's happened to these books? Are they... They're, they're largely... So most of these have, books... Were they translated? 
most of these books, I read them in uh, in either English or French mm -hmm. because they're more readily available in translation. Right. It's hard to get them. You've heard of uh, Thousand and One Nights? Okay. How many of you have read Thousand and One Nights or Tales from them? Okay. So they're quite they're quite bawdy, actually. And yet, you know, a couple of years ago, I think it was 2009, there was a move to try and have it banned in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Conserv and this mm -hmm. is long before the Islamists sort of ascended to power. So these books are largely lost. And it's in part due to the fact that educational systems have wound down. Uh, and also there isn't, people, literacy rates are very high, but people don't actually read very much anymore. And that's because of television? Or? In, large, in, 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 in large part, yes. Uh, I had a, oh, before we um, return to the room, I just had a question kind of bouncing off of this gentleman's question about <clears throat> uh, other uh, Muslim countries, because Bangladesh is one country where some of the most interesting sex worker activism is happening. And in fact, uh, you probably know this, the spokesperson for the Network of Sex Work Projects, which is an international NGO, is a Malaysian lady, a transgender Muslim lady by the name of Kartini Slama. Um, but is there a, so, so there's, there's no assumption, we don't have to assume that this couldn't happen in, a, in an Islamic environment, but is there a, a country in the Arab region that you think is sort of poised, has the conditions to be the country where the kind of the sex worker spring would take place? You know, where sex workers will come into their own politically in that country and, you know, be a kind of, uh, <clears throat> Uh, play a leading role for other sex workers? No. <laughs> but you think it, it, it will never happen? Or, I mean, what about Morocco or Tunisia? Well, in Morocco and Tunisia, sex outside of marriage is actually illegal in law. We don't even have those laws in Egypt. Right. So, you know, Egypt is ironic. Egypt is, is now seen as highly conservative, and yet we don't have laws which explicitly criminalize premarital sex or explicitly criminalize sodomy. But those laws are present in Morocco and, and Tunisia. Now, what this goes to show you is that just having a law doesn't necessarily change attitudes. Attitudes can be very conservative, mm -hmm. irrespective of the presence of a law. If I can just go back to sure. the gentleman's question about power within the family, because this relates to law. So female genital mutilation uh, occurs, wi it's widespread in Egypt, about 90% of women under age 50 are circumcised. 90, 90, 90. 90. And if you look at 15 to 17 year olds, because it's done around age 9 to 12, they're about 80% of, of how, how, him are circumcised. He doesn't believe it. How do you know that? Yeah. Because, it, because it's acceptable. It's socially, it's one of those aspects of private life. You can actually ask women, are you circumcised? And they will tell you. Now, they may be more likely to say yes than no because of the social acceptability of FGM. Nonetheless, I mean, it is, it, we do have some data and it is widespread. The reason I'm bringing this up is that it's women who make that decision. You talk about the power of women. Men are not involved in that decision-making process at all. It's mothers and grandmothers who, uh, who, who decide. And to go to the point about the law, we have a good law in Egypt that was passed the move by the mm -hmm. Mubarak regime to criminalize FGM. And many of the women I have met um, don't pay any heed to it whatsoever. And in fact, they, are, they conceptualize FGM in some cases as a form of resistance to an autocratic, unrepresentative government whom they think is in hawk to the West, or was in hawk to the West, and is passing laws which meddle in their private mm. behavior. And this is none of the government's business. I'm guessing this is sounding familiar to people in America. Uh, uh, we've had a lot of, heard a lot of news reports uh, from Tahrir Square that in, in terms of the assaults against women that have become apparently common uh, on all types of levels, amongst these assaults are police taking it upon themselves to do virginity tests. Now, to someone who is you know, much more of a Westerner, this is all very, almost surrealistic, except I, I, I think it's true. It, and, and has Egypt passed laws that women have, by law, must be virgins until marriage? And so any police officer can just do some bizarre check on a woman. What's going on here? 
all and right. not related question. There's a film. Uh, there was a film made by a Tunisian feminist about eight or ten years ago called Satin Rouge. Oh yes, Satin Rouge. Yes. And, and if you could talk about that, and how realistic was that? I've spent some time in Tunisia. I, I'm fluent in French, not so fluent in Arabic. I thought it was factually plausible, but I don't have enough knowledge to make that judgment. Okay, so about the virginity test, as I say in the book, virginity remains what could best be described as a big fucking deal in the Arab world. Mm -hmm. It's very important, it's a complete double standard. In Islam, we are enjoined to remain chaste before marriage. Uh, the, the prophet uh, asked us, suggested that we should fast that that would help us. He did not mean that we were supposed to fast until our late 30s, which is now the average age of marriage, but that's another story. The reality is that men, men will have uh, relations before marriage, and, but if women do, the burden falls on them very heavily. And one consequence of this, for example, is when I was in uh, Morocco uh, looking at uh, HIV outreach with sex workers, uh, mm -hmm. I met mm -hmm. uh, some uh, young um, students who were supplementing their income by turning tricks on the Atlantic Corniche. And when we uh, offered them condoms, they said, oh, we don't need condoms. Uh, there's no chance of us getting pregnant. We only do anal sex. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that they wanted to preserve their hymens. And they, they wanted to get married, and they knew if they broke that, that they would be unable to marry. And so there is very much a double standard around virginity. And it's not just the authorities who do virginity tests in this uh, case that you're talking about. The, the army mandated that. That was more of a tool of intimidation, quite frankly, because they don't want women protesting. And one way to clear them out of the streets is if you think you're going to be you know, physically violated by, uh, by the authorities. So that's more of a, a tool of control. There isn't one. There isn't one. Actually, forced medical testing, which, of which this is an element, was illegal under the Egyptian constitution. But hey, who cares what's in the constitution? We had a great constitution during the Mubarak period. Horrendous abuses of, right. of, of, human, of human rights. What's interesting, though, about virginity testing, it's not just the authorities. In Egypt, there is a practice called dokhla. And dokhla used to consist uh, of, and still does in some villages, in which on the wedding night, the um, traditional midwife would come into, the, into the, the, the marriage chamber, and she would pierce the woman's hymen, and they would collect the blood. And so th it's clear that you have delivered an intact bride. This is really important not for the woman's herself, but for the family, because the woman's honor is related to the family's honor and the men's honor, and that's about delivering a virgin bride. So dokhla now has become uh, what's called dokhla uh, afrangi. So what happens is that you put a sheet down on the, wedding, uh, on the wedding bed, and the bride is expected to bleed onto it, and then you right. take the cloth and you give it to the family. And it's not just some sort of rural practice or uneducated person's practice. Middle class people do this as well. It's very, impo it's very important. Um, on Satin Rouge, um, I'm, I, I know of the film, I have not seen it. But what I can tell you is that this image of Tunisia as being this incredibly progressive place under Ben Ali, uh, for women's rights, and it's the only country in the Arab world that offers abortion on demand. Um, but it wasn't. They had laws against homosexuality, had laws against premarital sex, had a whole range of legal strictures, but more importantly, had some of the most horrendous human rights abuses that are not only against sexual rights, they're against women's rights, but they're against men's rights as well. So very often, laws around uh, women's rights are used, have been used as a sort of cover, basically. You can appear to be progressive to outsiders, mm -hmm. but the reality is that your practices are as regressive as anywhere else that's ostensibly conservative in the Arab world. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry about this. Can we just take this poor, poor woman and we'll come back? Two, two quick questions. One, can you hold up to your back? Is, um, there, is the reason that the is, is the reason that the mothers and grandmothers want female uh, genital mutilation to make their daughters more attractive for wives to the men? Is that the reason, or is there something else going on? It's question one. I don't know if you want to answer it, then I'll follow up with my next question. Um, very, very briefly, there are a number of reasons why they do it. One is tradition. They all will dress it up in religion and say it's you know, mandated, but it isn't. I mean, there are a number of religious figures who say it's completely contrary to both Christianity and Islam. The main driver for it is that they believe that the clitoris is a dynamo of female sexual energy, and if you do not uh, curb it, uh, girls will wander before marriage, and they will make excessive demands of their husbands during marriage. 
and these will be marriage killers. And remember, marriage is the citadel. It's the, it's the center of all sexual life. And in my experience, most people do not want to pull down the citadel. Most people want to get inside the citadel. And so the challenge for us in the years to come is to actually, how do we build out the citadel? How do we begin to take in other populations, like unwed mothers, for example, or divorced women? Or the biggest single problem, Tracy, going back to your earlier question about mm -hmm. economics, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. that the cost of marriage has increased so much in the Arab world, and we have so little employment for young people that they can't afford to get married. So we have these legions of young people now who are having to wait till their 30s, but they're not supposed to be having sex. What on earth are they going to do? Of course, they do have relations. It goes under the table. So the question is, how can we build out the citadel, take in these populations, take in some of the tricky issues like abortion, the difficult terrain like sexuality education, and then eventually we pull down the citadel from the inside. And that's, in my opinion, how social change will occur in the Arab world. The other question is, I read a, a news article in the New York Times about how in Afghanistan, the politically elite men often will have a boy, 10, 11, 12, who's from a poor family, who not only serves some tea, but is forced to have sex with them. How common did you find that sort of practice? The article was talking about how American soldiers are finding themselves powerless to stop this practice. Um, I didn't look at Afghanistan because I looked at the Arab world, and Afghanistan okay. is, is outside the Arab world. I, I have to say that in the long history of homosexuality in the Arab region, this was quite common. You remember the cultural construct, which largely applies today, is that if you're the active partner, you're not really homosexual. You're just a man. And so the stigma is on the passive, the passive partner, historically who tended to be a boy. And in fact, if you go back to these great books of Arabic erotica, they have whole sections on something called creeping, which is the art of essentially a creeping up on the boy and raping him. But again, it's about power, right? It's about the power of the adult male and the passive younger, younger male. So there is most definitely a tradition of this, although it is haram. Everyone knew it was haram. Right. It happened. And, uh, but today, the problem is that there is a real denial right. that, these, that homosexuality exists in the Arab world. And if there is an acknowledgment, ah, it's a Western import. And the other problem was is that the young boys tried to run away. They'd either be tortured or even killed. It's, it's, uh, I'm not familiar with the, the, the situation in Afghanistan. Quick question, and I generally despise questions in the form of a statement, but uh, I want to know if you mentioned uh, American soldiers abroad, and I wondered if my experience is at all representative to your findings or if this is an outlier, but in uh, rural Iraq, it was not uncommon for um, male Iraqi soldiers to have sex with one another. This was justified in two ways, as far as I was aware. One was, oh, it's just hazing, which I take to mean rape. Or, um, well, this is rural Iraq. There are the male, the female to male ratio is so low, and marriage is so important uh, in order to have sex mm -hmm. that this is essential, essentially masturbation. Um, and then a very odd, troubling, and I'm sorry to be a huge downer <laughs> experience was that a uh, father came to the base with his child, I think the child was seven. We had the best hospital in the region, obviously, and uh, thought there was some sort of urinary issue. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I met the father, I saw the father, the father was absolutely concerned, devastated, wondered what was wrong with his son. Found out later that the father uh, was told by the, the doctors that the, the child had both male and female um, reproductive organs. Okay. And the result of that was that the seven-year-old child was killed by the father oh. for reasons of pride or shame or any number of those things. And I wondered, we've talked a lot about middle class um, Muslims, and we've talked about wealthier, more developed countries, and I wondered to what extent uh, is what I heard about or, or experienced representative of rural, more impoverished Muslim countries. I, I, Iraq is a is a is a, it, 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 it's a specific case in the in the Arab region, and I focused mainly on Egypt and other countries, which I thought offered models of how to move forward on some of the sexual hangups in Egypt. 
because it's important to get things to work in Egypt, because if they work in Egypt, they're most li more likely to be exported to places like Iraq. The, the, the transfer doesn't occur the other way. Mm -hmm. um, Iraq is a special, is a special case uh, because of the conflict and the poverty and all the dynamics that are going on there that are really not, are exceptional. This is not, these are exceptional times and there are unusual uh, be behaviors. Um, I have to say, in the case of the soldiers having relations with each other, of course it happens. It's documented across the Arab region. And because of sex segregation, basically, it's often easier. And because of, there is a cover of homosociality. So men, if you're walking in the streets of the Arab world, you'll see men holding hands. You'll see men kissing on, on the cheek, for example, or rubbing noses. But if it were a man and a woman doing that, there would be outrage in many, in, 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 in many quarters. Um, and it doesn't mean, it doesn't signal gayness, it's something else, it's just yeah. guys being friendly. Uh, abs absolutely, okay. and, and in part because there are these barriers, either very formalized in some countries like in Saudi Arabia where it's much more institutionalized, or even they're sort of self-imposed, um, you do find these very strong same-sex interactions, but they're not necessarily sexual. On the point of the, the poor child who is... Um, essentially uh, hermaphrod, uh, hermaphrod, uh, intersex. intersex, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, that actually, uh, sex change operations in Sunni Islam are permitted. And in fact, there are a number of fatwas from across the region which permit sex change operations in those circumstances. In fact, one of the world's leading centers for sex change surgery is in fact in Saudi Arabia, and where they're doing uh, hundreds of surgeries on intersex. The difficulty becomes on transgendered individuals. And in Sunni Islam, the majority opinion is that, no, it, it's a bit of fudge factor here. But generally speaking, if you just have this as a sexual identity question or gender identity question, the answer is no. You can't be changed. But what's interesting is that in Shia Islam, it's very different. Shia Islam, and there was a fatwa from the uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, uh, which actually permits sex change operations in such circumstances. But that may do, be, be do more, the, what happened to that child may be do more to, as you say, it's a rural area, it's ignorance. But the principle remains, it's about the family honor, about the collective honor. And that's the, the single biggest, in my opinion, the, one of the biggest obstacles to achieving anything close to sexual rights. So with that, that child, oh, sorry. One question sorry, here. Could you clarify, has, um, has the war influenced sexual culture uh, culturally? In Iraq? In Iraq? Sorry, the war? In, in Muslim culture or local Iraq culture? I, I don't look at Iraq. Sorry, so I can't, I can't comment on that because I did not do my research in Iraq. My research was focused on, on, on Egypt. Egypt. Yeah. <laughs> do you want to just tell us quickly which countries you visit in the book? Obviously, Egypt. Uh, Morocco, Tunisia, spoke to people in Algeria. Mm -hmm. uh, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, uh, talk to people in Oman, uh, Lebanon, talk to people in Jordan. Um, great, uh, great story with work, talking to Palestinians in, in, in Israel, some really innovative work uh, there, and talk to, also talk to people uh, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, doing work in Syria. I wanted to ask, um, what is the prevalence of honor killing in Egypt? Is that something that still happens? We, we simply don't know. I mean, they are by definition shadowy, and um, there is no reliable, there is absolutely no reliable evidence on that. And certainly uh, Manny, the woman I mentioned who wanted to get married and her parents said no, well, she said one of you know, the issues is that honor killing, it happens. In, 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 it happened in my family. My, one of my relatives a couple of generations ago, she went, and the story is kept alive to keep the girls girls in line. It, it, the statistics are very poor. What I can tell you is that I have come across um, academics who have told me a very interesting phenomenon, which is the false honor crime, in which men will mm. actually have killed a female member for, let's say, money, financial reasons, but will actually say it's an honor crime because it actually gives them a reduced sentence. Mm -hmm. my, so. my other question was, you said that uh, marriage is the citadel. What is sex like inside of a typical marriage? And uh, are, are the children? <laughs> I mean, it's, 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 it's a very good question, and it's hard to answer, because the problem is that we don't have a Kinsey report. We don't have a Height report. We don't really have any basis for uh, answering that question, and I call for it in, in, in my book. 
I can only give you anecdote. Right. And in my experience in talking to couples, uh, women are frustrated. Let me turn that around, actually. I don't want to talk about it in negative terms. I want to talk about it in terms of longing. They are longing for better communication with their husbands. They're longing for more spark in their, in, in their marriage. They want romance. Um, the men I met, and again, these are snapshots. I'm, don't, please don't generalize uh, from this, extrapolate from this. But they were frustrated. They wanted more. And yet when their wives tried to show some spark, they were horrified. I'm one of these instances I talk about in the book, uh, a young woman who was reading up before marriage, wanted to, this was her big night, and when she um, initiated some activity, her husband hauled her out of bed and made her swear on a Quran that she had never had relations before marriage. Bit of a downer for the rest of the night's proceedings. Uh, uh, so in my experience, there is a sort of conflict going on. People want more, but they're not sure how to achieve more. But I think in the years to come, because we are heading into what I hope is a different period in uh, Egyptian history and, and it for, me, for much of the region, you know, once we get through this very tricky transitional period and no one's certain how long that's going to last, I think we are heading into a better, into a better place. Because people can now start talking about these issues, just as the gentleman who asked about the rapes in, uh, in Tahrir, uh, virginity testing, the one th positive thing that's coming out of all this is a uh, willingness to speak openly now about sexual violence. W 10 years ago, when a woman was raped, she would never speak out. And now people are coming to the, the fore. And the key, at the end of the day, is switching this increasing openness about sex to talking not just about sex as a crisis or a scandal or a tragedy, but sex as something positive and sex as a, a real force for empowerment of men and women for well-being. And the reason I keep going back to the old literature is that there was an ability a thousand years ago to find the fun in sex and to talk about it as a source of power for, 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 for men and women. And we have lost that. And I hope that we can recapture that in, in the decades to come. Okay, two, two, two final questions, I'm afraid we're going to... Maybe if, we, if they're going to be very, very short, we can add so there's one at the back and then one here, and, and that's going to be it, unless, unless, unless it was going to be really, really quick. Okay. Uh, no. <laughs> I, I just wanted to ask actually about the healthcare infrastructure and training for health professionals, and um, particularly as it pertains to HIV AIDS um, and how. Uh, open they are, how trained they are, not only in um, testing, but in treating, um, and what that looks like. Okay, again, in the interest of brevity, I'm just going to speak about Egypt. I mean, some of the worst stigma and discrimination that people living with HIV encounter is amongst healthcare professionals. It is truly appalling. I've done work with women living with HIV, and they have, for example, been unable to find anyone who will deliver their babies because of the fear of contracting HIV amongst uh, healthcare professionals because the education is so poor, but also because of the stigma that these women are seen as bad women because they have somehow engaged, the, the assumption is that they've had sex outside of marriage. Mm -hmm. And yet the majority of women who contract HIV in the Arab world got it from their husbands. Um, but, uh, and, and homophobia is horrendous, truly horrendous in the medical, in the medical profession. But I can tell you a funny story. The, there's so little sexuality education in, um, in, in, in medical schools in most of the Arab region. It's starting, but it's still rudimentary. Heba, Heba Ott, who's arguably the Arab world's most famous uh, sex therapist. She had a show on, on, on television. She's a celebrity in, in Egypt and much of the Arab world. The only class in Cairo, in Cairo Medical School that she had on uh, sexuality was cancelled due to freak rain. And that was it, basically. Freak rain, a rainstorm. And that was it, one class in the course of all. Uh, and as a consequence of this, you often find, for example, doctors are the major, per, major uh, practitioners performers of FGM, and many of them will endorse it. They think circumcision is a good thing because they themselves have very little knowledge of sexual anatomy or, you know, or the more complex aspects of sexuality. So there's a lot to be done and also on, on, on HIV AIDS education amongst healthcare professionals. Um, you're, you're painting a by and large interesting picture. Maybe it's appropriate a bit. My question is only this. Uh, Orthodox Judaism has been uh, the enemy of, of sexuality, uh, Christianity, uh, 
has been the enemy of sexuality, the new 76-year-old pope. I would feel the youth mark me so young. It's really <laughs> going to be terrible for sexuality. Uh, and then, you know, you, you, you promote Islam. Does Islam have anything to do with this, or is it, does it get a pass? Is Islam, in your view, uh, positive and liberating about sexuality, or is it in some way responsible for the dismal picture you paint? Well, A, I don't think it is a dismal picture. I find this really interesting because a lot of my book is talking about the solutions that people who are trying to f achieve happiness in their sexual lives, whether it's in individual choices or it's community projects or even trying to change national law. So my book is actually quite, is quite hopeful and I am quite optimistic. I think the problem is not Islam. I think the problem are the interpretations that we as Muslims have imposed upon it and why we have gravitated to these very restrictive interpretations when we could have wider interpretations. But it, as you say, it's not unique to Islam. And one of the most interesting aspects of writing this book was talking to uh, some very innovative Palestinians living in Israel and listening to them talk about sexual culture in Israel as well and the, seeing the parallels between some of the more orthodox uh, followers of Judaism. I mean, it's not far off what we see in Islamic conservatives as well. I think the key issue and the difference to how change came about in the West is that the majority of people I have met in the Arab world do not want to put religion to their backs. They want to, whether they're Muslims or Christians, they want to live within the parameters of their faith. And so that's why I'm arguing the book, if we're going to do that, and I respect anyone who chooses to do that, and I think you should have the choice to do that, that it should not be imposed by the state, but we are very far from that. But if, okay, we're going to live within these parameters, there is flexibility, there is a spectrum within these parameters. Let us ask questions, let us explore it. So, um, why don't we have one more question? Since, I don't, since, 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 since you've all been very, very patient and you're obviously eager to carry on talking, one, one last question. I have two minor questions. First <laughs> question. <laughs> um, well, maybe you can relate them. Uh, my, um, I guess I'm wondering if you can share any experiences um, in which, or stories in which you were surprised within your research with what you found, and two, if the issue of female masturbation ever came up with your um, subjects, or is that so taboo that even in this no, no. scope? No, no, masturbation is. Uh, let me deal with the the, the less sen less sensitive part first. Um, masturbation um, is a big issue for men and and women. Uh, the standard line in Islam uh, from conservative. Uh, commentators is that you're going to go to hell and before you go to hell you're going to be blind, deformed and demented mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. impotent mm -hmm. as well. Sounds um, like Christianity also. Well yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Not, not, not far off. Uh, conservative attitudes in, in, in most religions. There are of course, with, for young people, the power of the internet is you can find all this very conservative opinion but you can also now find alternative views in Arabic. Uh, that are discussing these issues very, very openly and, and frankly. Uh, so it's an issue for both, for both men, uh, men and women, uh, and they are troubled by it, for, for, for sure. Um, in terms of the, the surprises, I think twofold. Um, I, I, just I'm going to talk about general themes because the, actually the stories are going to take me too long to tell, but uh, one, the, dis the disconnect between appearance and reality the emphasis on not what you do, but what you're seen to be doing. And that really comes down very hard on, on women. And actually, I'll give you just one anecdote about that. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a Lebanese uh, TV show that had uh, an episode, it's like a talk show, very provocative, had an episode on sexual life in the Arab region. And they had people from Morocco and Egypt uh, talking, often behind a screen. They had one episode with a man from Jeddah, so Saudi Arabian, who gave us a glimpse of his sexual life. And it was tame by Western standards, for sure. It was almost, you know, girlishly uh, 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 mm -hmm. uh, discreet. Yeah. Um, the day after, um, there were thousands of complaints to the governor of Jeddah. He was sacked from his job uh, at Saudi, Air Saudi Arabian Airlines because he said that his fantasy was having sex at, what is it, what is it Mile High Club or something? <laughs> the, the fact he worked on the ground staff was neither here nor there. Uh, oh, they sacked oh. him. Uh, and uh, he was sentenced to, a, 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 oh. I think, five years imprisonment and a thousand lashes. Oh. But what is most interesting, the sentence was commuted, but what was most interesting is that he was not being punished for what he did. He was right. being punished for what he said he had done. And we don't have a culture of confession 
in Islam. We are enjoined to uh, conceal our sins. The problem and the challenge we have in the years to come is that we need to start finding a way to speak out <coughs> on these issues. Because when we have this gap between appearance and reality, so many problems come in, whether it's sexual violence, sexual dissatisfaction within marriage, or HIV AIDS. We need to find a way to talk about these things. And my argument I make in the book is, a thousand years ago, not that we go back to that period, it was a different time, there is, I'm not a sexual Salafi here, okay? Um, but what I'm saying is that our ancestors had, seemed to have an ability to reconcile Islam with the needs of the flesh, and they were able to talk about it and generate information, and that's what we need to recapture that spirit.